evening, Highland Park. Hope this finds you all in great spirits. Um, as I record, it's wet, it's dreary, and it's a little chilly outside, so hopefully the day has gotten better for us. But thank you for joining us tonight as we conclude our study on Gideon. We're going to be in chapter 8 tonight and finish up our in-depth look at Gideon. As I told you before, most people I look back on take uh, all three chapters and they do it in one 45-minute setting. Uh, I think I've thrown out more than I've been able to share, but uh, hopefully we will conclude it tonight and have a better overall view of Gideon as we walk through the book of Judges. As always, make sure you use that prayer sheet that Miss Amy sends out. To, uh, there were quite a few new names added to the prayer list because of things that went on this pack week, past week. So we have a lot of brothers and sisters that are hurting that could use our intercession um, as we lift them up and cover them in prayer. I will pray for us, and we'll get into our study tonight. All right, let's pray. Oh, merciful Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for allowing us to put our feet on the ground. Father, for, for giving us boldness and courage to be able to speak to others about you, to be able to testify about your mercy and your grace, um, to testify that we are saved by grace through faith, that, Father, our salvation is out of our hands. It is because of you that, um, that you are the only one that can truly save. And, Father, we thank you and praise you for that. And, Father, we come to you tonight seeking clarity. Father, asking that you would send the Holy Spirit to illuminate the Scripture, that you would speak through your Word in a manner that would continue the sanctification you have going on in our lives. Father, in a manner that would continue to draw us closer to you. Uh, so, Father, we please uh, reveal your word to us. Use it to transform us and use us to be a light in a lost and dying world for your glory, for your praise, and for your honor. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining. And just by way of review, we are in Judges 8 tonight. But just to, to look back on it, to, to bring us up to speed in case you by chance missed of the last two episodes, and if you have, you can always go back and, and re-watch them. But for tonight's purposes, we started off with Gideon in chapter 6. We find Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press. Yes, wheat in a wine press when an angel of the Lord appears unto an oak, under an oak. And then a little, bit, a little bit later, makes himself visible to Gideon and greets him as valiant warrior. And says to go in the strength of yours and, and to save Israel. And there is a conversation that goes on between Gideon, the valiant warrior, and this angel as Gideon has a dawning realization of actually who he's talking to. And we find out that Gideon was actually talking to a, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ as he was standing there to go in the strength. And we find that it comes to full fruition as Gideon says, wait, let me prepare an offering. The offering is put out on the stone, and then the offering is burnt up and consumed. And Gideon is in fear for his life because he has seen the face of the Lord, and he's fearful of dying. And the angel reassures him, but tells him that, look, before I can be Lord over all of you, you have to get rid of the gods among you. And he tells Gideon to go tear down the altar in his village, which ironically his father is in charge of, and to build a new altar and to sacrifice a bull. Gideon does that. The town wakes up um, just incensed that somebody has tore down their Asherah pole, and they find out that it is Gideon, and they go after Joash and tell him to give Gideon to them, and Joash makes that statement, let Baal contend for himself. Um, and then Gideon proceeds to fleece the Lord and ask the Lord to just reveal more of his nature to prove to him. Um, we get further insight as we go through chapter 7, where God selects Gideon's army. And even though Gideon starts off with 32,000 men, 22,000 just disappear because they're too scared to fight. Another 10,000 disappear because they drink water incorrectly. And God utilizes 300 men to liberate Israel and to do so, so Israel won't elevate herself over God and think that their own strength has saved them. Um, through his unique strategy, after having a reassuring visit at the enemy camp and hearing them talk about the fact that God has handed the camp over to Gideon, um, Gideon attacks with trumpets and with torches and with jars. Um, they rout the army. The army flees. 
And well, that's the point we're at as we get into chapter 8. Um, and he calls out for the men of Ephraim to join the battle and cut them off at the Jordan and to stop them from crossing over. So if you would, in your copy of God's Word, follow along and we're just going to read the entirety of Judges chapter 8. The men of Ephraim said to him, Why have you done this to us, not calling us when you went to fight against the Midianites? And they argued with him violently. So he said to them, What have I done now compared to you? Is not the gleaning of Ephraim better than the grape harvest of Abiezer? God handed over to you Oreb and Zeb, the two princes of Midian. What was I able to do compared to you? And when he said this, their anger against him subsided. Gideon and the three hundred men came to the Jordan and crossed it. They were exhausted, but still in pursuit. He said to the men of Succoth, Please give some loaves of bread to the troops under my command, because they are exhausted. For I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. But the princes of Succoth asked, Are Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hands, that we should give bread to your army? Gideon replied, Very well. When the Lord has handed Zeba and Zalmunna over to me, I will tear your flesh with thorns and briars from the wilderness. He went from there to Penuel and asked the same thing from then. The men of Penuel answered just as the men of Succoth had answered. He also told the men of Penuel, When I return safely, I will tear down this tower. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkar, and with them was their army of about 15,000 men who were left of the entire army of the Kedemites. Those who had been killed were 120,000 armed men. Gideon traveled on the caravan route east of Noab and Jogba and attacked their army while the army felt secure. Zeba and Zalmunna fled and he pursued them. He captured these two kings of Midian and routed the entire army. Gideon, son of Joash, returned from the battle by the ascent of Hears. He captured a youth from the men of Succoth and interrogated him. The youth wrote down for him the names of the seventy-seven leaders and elders of Succoth. Then he went to the men of Succoth, here, and said, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna. You taunted me about them, saying, Are Zeba and Zalmunna now in your power, that we should give bread to your exhausted men? So he took the elders of the city, and he took some thorns and briars from the wilderness, and he disciplined the men of Succoth with them. He also tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. He asked Zeba and Zalmunna, What kind of men did you kill at Tabor? They were like you, they said, each resembled the son of a king. So he said, They were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. Then he said to Jether, his firstborn, Get up and kill them. The youth did not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a youth. Ziba and Zalmunna said, Get up and strike us down yourself, for a man is judged by his strength. So Gideon got up and killed Zeba and Zalmunna and took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us as well as your sons and your grandsons, for you delivered us from the power of the Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Then he said to them, Let me make a request of you. Everyone give me an earring from his plunder. Now the enemy had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. They said, we agreed to give them. So he spread out a cloak and everyone threw an earring from his plunder on it. The weight of the gold earrings he requested was 43 pounds of gold. In addition to the crescent ornaments and ear pendants, the purple garments on the kings of Midian and the chains on the necks of the camels. Gideon made an ephod from all this and put it in Ophrah, his hometown. Then all Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his household. Verse 28. So Midian was subdued before the Israelites, and they were no longer a threat. The land had peace for 40 years during the days of Gideon. Jeroboam, that is Gideon, son of Joash, went back to live in his house. Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, since he had many wives. His concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he named him Abimelech. 
Then Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. When Gideon died, the Israelites turned and prostituted themselves by worshiping the Baals and the Baal Bereth, their god. The Israelites did not remember the Lord, their God, who had rescued them from the hands of the enemies around them, and they did not show kindness to the house of Jeroboam, that is, Gideon, for all the good that he had done. It's quite a lengthy chapter and, and quite a text for us today, but there's some really good stuff in this text, and uh, I think you'll see as we close out Gideon everything that God has in store for us, at least I pray that you will, that God will speak to us through his text. So far, as we've walked through the book, now in our eighth chapter of Judges, after every judge that, that we have encountered, that we have come across, God has rescued his people from Israel, or his people Israel, from the oppression of the enemy, from the persecution that they have been going through. And the only information that we're ever given after that is the land had rest for X amount of years, regardless of or depending upon the amount of time that the land had rest. That's the only information to date that we've been given after every judge that has come along. But with Gideon, there is a change in the structure of the text, and there's a, ch a change in what we're given. And it's due to the downward spiral in the book of Judges. If you recall, when we started off, I told you that the book of Judges is just a continued downward spiral as the nation of Israel continues just to degrade into sin. And as we go through the book of Judges, the judges themselves continue to degrade and get worse and worse and worse um, for the first time. And when we're in our study of the book of Judges, we see two things that pop up to us. And the number one thing that should, that should have caught your eye prayerfully, I, I pray that it did, is that the nation of Israel turns from worshiping the one true God to prostituting themselves to idols before the judge actually Dies. We're going to see that in our text tonight. And the second thing is, we're going to see some serious, serious flaws in the judge's rule as Gideon's legacy comes to a close. We'll see the glaring flaws as we walk through the text tonight. And as we begin, it's important that we go back a little bit and that we understand some of the tribes. Ephraim comes up in this, the tribe of Ephraim. And it's important that we understand that Ephraim is a very, very powerful tribe. They are a huge, massive tribe um, that just greatly outnumbers Gideon and the tribe that he comes from. And as we start, it's important to know that because Ephraim's been called by Gideon to stop them at the Jordan. And when they stop them and they bring them in, the men of Ephraim are just fit to be tied. They are incensed and they are livid that Gideon didn't call them out when all this started, that they were called left to do clean up do it, clean up duty. But if we're honest, and, and we look at the whole scenario in the context, it's highly unlikely that Ephraim, this powerful tribe, would have submitted themselves to be under the leadership of Gideon. Gideon's tribe was a very small tribe. He, he was from the weakest clan in that tribe, and he was the weakest in his entire family. So just from a, a logical standpoint, it's very highly unlikely that Gideon going up to them and telling them, hey, submit to me, that Ephraim in itself would have submitted to them. So why is Ephraim so upset? Why are they so livid and cantankerous, I guess you could say, as they approach him uh, with verse 1? Why have you done this to us? Not calling us when you went to fight against the Midianites. What's the, what's the true root of their ire and their, and their anger that comes up over them? Um, and I think the thing that we, we pull away from this is that they're missing out on the glory that would come from the victory. They are a mighty tribe, and not being involved in all of this, they're missing out on the glory. And it tells us a few things right off the bat. As we see Ephraim's anger from not being able to partake of the glory that would come from the victory, and it tells us that God was absolutely right when he said, Israel might elevate themselves over me and say, my own strength saved me. Now, we know when we read the text that God was right, but here we find the text actually validating Oh, what God has told Gideon, the reason God shaved his army down to 300 so God could only get the glory. Ephraim is upset 
because they weren't able to partake in the glory, that they weren't able to have people praise them and sing songs about them and their victory. And I think the second thing we learn off of this is that Ephraim wouldn't have submitted to the judge that God had called and put in place. They wouldn't have submitted to Gideon because he was the least of the least. He wasn't the person uh, from the, one of the strongest tribes. But through this all, we need to understand how diplomatic and, and how even killed Gideon is. And listen in verse 2. He tells them, so he says to them, after this tribe rises up in anger, he says, what have I done now compared to you? Is not the gleaning of Ephraim better than the grape harvest of Abi Ezer? That's him. He says, what have we done? In comparison to what you have done, look how much stronger your tribe is uh, than my little clan that I have. And in the very next verse, Gideon tells them that, that unlike his little clan, they've already conquered and killed the people that they were after. In verse 3, the first part, he says, God handed over to you, O Reb and Zeb, the two princes of Midian. What was I able to do in comparison to you? The two that we were after, Ephraim, got away from us, and as we're pursuing, we couldn't catch them. You came out, and you've already caught and killed and executed the two that we were after. Well, what have I done in comparison to you? And apparently, his, his even kill and his manner of dealing with the tribe of Ephraim worked like a charm because at the very last part of verse 3, it says, when he said this, their anger against him subsided. Their anger his anger just went away because he, he gave them the false praise. He gave them the honor. He gave them the glory. What? What have I done in comparison to you? You're a mighty, you're a huge tribe, big tribe. Oh, forget about it. So he praises them for the victory, for the glory. And then their anger just kind of washes away. And understand that. Gideon was reprimanded. He was dressed down in front of everybody. Gideon, the Lord's anointed, the valiant warrior that God had called, was dressed down in front of everybody by this mighty tribe of Ephraim, yet he held his tongue, right? Instead of lashing out, instead of fighting back, um, if he just fulfills Ephraim's desire for praise, Ephraim's desire for glory. He just heaps it on top of him. And the last part of verse 3 tells us that their anger against him subsided. It just kind of went away and disappeared. And if we take this all in here in this story, verse by verse, and we watch Gideon respond in this kind of manner, you know, it almost gets us. We want to just go, yeah, you go, boy. Just pat him on the back for, for his faithfulness, for his submissiveness, for the way that, that he walked through it, the way of his humility and his peacefulness just come shining through and, and just take care of the situation in a great way to take care of it. You know, but... You do that and you just read on a few verses and we figure out the true reasoning behind Gideon's response and the true reasoning that his diplomacy comes shining through towards Ephraim. You know, as this, the narrative continues, we find out that, that Gideon heads on. He takes his 300 men and they're pursuing uh, Zeba and Zalmunna. And, and as they're pursuing him, his troops are tired. His troops are hungry. They are just flat worn out from a long, long road. So when he comes to the first town of Succoth, Gideon uh, goes up to him and says, Hey, my guys are tired. My guys are hungry. They need some food. Can you go ahead and give us some food? Um, and when he asks Succoth, Gideon receives Gideon receives the same kind of response from Succoth that he originally originally received from Ephraim when they came upon him. Uh, he receives ingratitude for defeating the enemy um, as they just rail up against him. And in simpler terms, Succoth looks at him and goes, okay, what? What? You want us to feed your troops? Do you have Zeba and Zalmuna with you now? We don't see him. I don't see him anywhere. Don't come to us until you got them, because we're not going to help you. You haven't really defeated anybody at that point. So don't come to us for help that you might need right now. You know, and since they have been, we need to keep in mind, since they've been so brutally oppressed for the past seven years, since they've had to fight for every little corn of food that they've had, they probably have thinking that's along this line. You know, the Midians are a huge army. And, and Gideon defeated them back there, but a large portion of them are escaping and getting out. And if they get all the way out and they get back home and they regroup, 
they're probably going to come back, and they're going to come back with a vengeance. And if they come back with a vengeance, then Gideon and anybody, any person or any town that has assisted him is going to be in some serious trouble. So we are not going to do anything at all until this is completely defeated. You see the, you see the, the difference that's going on here? Ephraim was upset because Gideon didn't call him earlier so they could share in the victory, so they could share in the honor and the glory and, and, and have all the praise. And Succoth is upset that they didn't call, Gideon didn't come to him and call him later. You need to come to us after this is all done. And once it's all done, then we'll, then we'll help you. We'll take care of the things that we need to do. And as Gideon moves to the next town, Peniel, he gets the exact same response. Um, listen to 8. He went... He went from there to Peniel and asked the same thing from them. And the men of Peniel answered just as the men of Succoth had answered. But I, I want you to see this, because I told you we find the true meaning behind the way Gideon responded to Ephraim. Listen to how Gideon's response to Succoth and Peniel differ greatly and how he responded to Ephraim. And listen, I'm going to read verses 7 and 9. And this is, verse 7 is his response to Succoth, and verse 9 is his response to Peniel. Listen to what he says. Gideon replied, and this is to Succoth, Very well, when the Lord has handed Zeba and Zalmunna over to me, I will tear your flesh with thorns and briars from the wilderness. That's his response to Succoth. Now his response to Penuel in verse 9, he says, He also told the men of Penuel, When I return safely, I will tear down this tower. You know, we, we can read those responses, and we can see the anger and the ire boiling up in Gideon, and we can look back to his response from Ephraim, and we almost get the hint, and we're kind of leaning towards, maybe it wasn't so diplomatic that he was able to reach out and, and speak kindly to Ephraim, it wasn't that so much as that he could not be diplomatic to Ephraim. Ephraim was a much larger tribe. Uh, they were bigger warriors. Gideon couldn't misspeak to Ephraim. He had to find a different tact. Otherwise, he would have overstepped and he would have had to face the consequences. Um, Ephraim was way too big for Gideon to be harsh like he was to Succoth, or like he was to the men of Peniel. But it also made, it also reveals something else to us um, as we look at the difference in these responses that Gideon has to the different people. Even though God made sure that the victory was so lopsided in his favor as to make sure that everyone would know that God was 100% percent responsible for the victory that God had provided the victory to Israel even though he made that abundantly aware to Gideon it seems as though Gideon is starting to forget that lesson that God had given him it seems that Gideon in his response to both of these towns and wanting some food for his men that are tired it seems to hint at us that Gideon thinks he is deserving of some praise or some honor that some respect should be shown him because he has just defeated this army and he's absolutely appalled that the men of Succoth or the town of Peniel the men of Peniel will not feed his troops so he lashes out he, and he lashes out irrationally on what his response is going to be and how he is going to deal with them. You know, see, when both towns fail to trust in Gideon that he is going to beat Midian, Gideon doesn't respond with... He could have responded like this. Yeah, you know, you know what? I understand you. The Midian's a huge army, that they're a bigger army, and it may seem as though they're going to win. But guys, listen, God has said that he has handed them over to us. So I get it if you don't want to trust me and if you don't want to feed my troops, but trust God because God is the one who said he is going to give us the victory, right? But Gideon doesn't respond like that. Gideon responds in what? What? You're not going to respect me, uh, what I say? Okay, wait till I get back. I'll show you what I'm going to do when I get back. And if you're not going to be respectful to me when I'm here, you want to doubt me? Then I'll show you my power when I get back. And I'll just lay it out on the line so it's something you can understand. And once I get done, then you'll realize that you should have respected me when I first came to your town. And Gideon goes out, and he's true to his word. Listen to verses 10 through 12. It says, Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkar, and with them was their army of about 15,000 men who were left 
all those left of the entire army of the Kedamites. Those who have been killed were 120,000 armed men. Gideon traveled on the caravan route east of Nobab and Jogba and attacked their army while the army felt secure. Ziba and Zalmunna fled and he pursued them. He captured the two kings of the Midian and routed the entire army. After he does that, he then captures one of his own people, a young man from Succoth, and pressures a young man from Succoth and telling me, look, I want the names of all the elders in Succoth. Um, and then he goes back to Succoth. He reminds him who he is, what he said, and then the scripture tells us that he beats them with thorns and briars from the wilderness, just like he said he would. And in Peniel, things get even worse. As Gideon not only tears down the tower, but scripture tells us that he kills all the men in the town. We have, there, I, I can't give you a reason or an explanation why the vast difference, unless his anger was just boiling over at the, at the fact, uh, the, the lack of respect that he received. It was heightened already at Succoth and he beat them in, but that didn't get rid of his anger and rage and anger from being disrespected. And he got to the town of Peniel, tore down the tower, and it just bubbled over. Don't know. But it seems, as this progresses, we get a new bit of information here with us. He says, He asked Ziba and Zalmunna, What kind of men did you kill at Tabor? They were like you, they said. Each resembled the son of a king. That's verse 18. And in verse 19, So he said, They were my brothers. So it appears now with this new information, we find out that Ziba and Zalmunna had actually killed Gideon's brothers. Well, now when that information comes in, on top, uh, on top of the way that he's responded to Succoth, and on top of the way that he has responded to Penuel, and due to his entire erratic behavior as we see this narrative progressing along, we got to ask ourselves, was Gideon's pursuit of Ziba and Zalmunna a, a strong desire to just be obedient to God's word and God's command, what God had put before him? Or was it a personal vendetta to avenge his brothers for the honor of his family? You know, and, and I can't think of any other reason, given the culture and the historic setting of this, I can't think of any other reason than a personal vendetta, because there's no reason he would have asked Jether, his firstborn, get up and kill them. Because his firstborn getting up and kill them would have been a youth killing elder men and warriors that would have restored honor to the family and would have defamed and just completely destroyed the honor and integrity of, of the other two individuals that he was going after. But regardless, however it works, it doesn't play out that way. And Gideon actually gets up and he winds up killing both individuals. And then he takes the jewelry from the camels and the victory is complete. But we have to ask ourselves, is, is that victory going to last? Is it going to be there for a while? You know, Gideon has already struggled, I think the text is clear to us, and, and that he has wanted honor, that he has wanted glory. Is that going to be just a one-time struggle, right? Amen? Because we all have those. We all have moments where we have lapses and, and we desire things that we shouldn't, and then we have to repent and we have to turn from it. Or is this something that's going to continue in the narrative for Gideon as we continue walking through? You know, we, we saw Gideon's rage make itself manifest when he didn't get what he thought he deserved, when the, the honor was there. And it, and it makes us question, made me question, I don't know if it made you question, made me question, was you know, success a good thing for Gideon? And, and yeah, I said that, was success a good thing for Gideon? Um, as he walked all the way through this, you know, success is good sometimes. Um but sometimes there can be a danger with success if we're not careful when we do have success. You know, just like Gideon, I think we can become addicted to success. You know, we can taste it. Um, we can sense the adoration, the praise, the, the people patting us on the back when we have that success. And we can become addicted to it. And worse, we can even become dependent upon it, success, if we're, if we're not cautious. So while success is good, on one hand, 
I think there's also a very rare, real, I can't talk today, but it's all right. We'll make it through. Just, just have to listen clear, right? <laughs> Success is good, but I think there's also a very real spiritual danger that accompanies success anytime we have success in our lives. And I think it's one we need to be aware of in our life as we experience success. And I think it's one we're warned about in our text tonight as we walk through this last chapter of Gideon. You know, if we're not careful when we have success, we can forget the grace of God and it starts to fade from our memories. We're inclined to believe that we can lift ourselves up. We can uh, accomplish that. And, you know, I've put in the work and we've put in the work and that's why we're successful at that. Um, and if we're not careful, and this is where it gets tricky, the success that God gives us, because we don't have success without God, amen? But the success that God gives us can almost confirm that line of thinking in us as we start to depend more on ourselves and not God. And it, and it gets worse for us because when we start thinking that way, we even start to think that we deserve the praise, that we deserve the worship, that we deserve the pats on the back and the attaboys or girls for all the different things that we get accomplished. You know, I've known many people in my short life um, that have just had their lives devastated. I mean, devastated by losing their job or by losing their spouse or their relationship. Uh, they've had their lives devastated by, by not getting that one promotion uh, that they wanted to have or just by simply failing in their career that they go after. They have success after success after success in their career, and then they fail at a point in their career, and it just destroys their lives. And all of these people have one thing in common. They are all defined by their jobs, or they are defined by their relationships that they have in life. It's their career, or it's their spouse, that provides their identity, who they are, what they will be, what they're striving to be. It's, it's their career, or it's their spouse that has provided them their happiness, their basis for the joy that they seek. And I have watched people go through um, those rough times, those times that we think it's insane, and they lose their spouse or they lose their career, and it'll, uh, it'll cause them to just seize up and stop. Um, it will cause them to either stop making their spouse or their career an idol in their life, right? Or it will cause them to just start that downward spiral. We've all, if we stop, can say, yes, I have seen that. Personally, both of those sides. And ultimately, the worst thing that happens to a person with that kind of mindset is success. Because the more success they have, the more that mindset comes in and the more apt they all are to fall. And success confirms the belief for them that they can do it on their own. That they can save their self, that they can, what's that uh, American mode or saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that they can, in fact, do it, that they have earned it, that we have made it, uh, they've achieved it, or, or that they truly have control of their lives and the direction that it's going. People of this nature that have success, they start to get all puffed up. Right? They start to get conceited, um, they start to get elegant, uh, arrogant, and they start to think that they are better off and more deserving of anything else, and they expect people to acknowledge that they are. I want you to go back with me as we're in Gideon here, and I don't want to get too far off course, but let's go back to Judges 7, 15, and, and remember this. This is when Gideon's down um, at, at the camp. He's just heard the dream. He's heard the interpretation. And in chapter 7, verse 15, Gideon says, or the scripture says, when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. Then he returned to Israel's camp and said, get up, for the Lord has handed the Midianite camp over to you. Do you remember that verse? Just last week, I think, that we studied and walked through that. You remember back then? Gideon knew his weakness. 
You know, God sent him to the camp to be reassured. He understood at that point that victory was only going to come through the grace of God, that success would only happen through the grace of God. And what did he do? He worshiped God because of that. But you know what? That's the last time back in chapter 7 that we see Gideon doing that. Now we're at a point, I think, where Gideon just worships the success. And, and he worships the victory and all the, that it brings with it, the earthly honor, the, the earthly glory, the things that fade away. He has completely forgotten who called him at this point. Um, I think he's forgotten his encounter with the angel that he has. Um, I think he's forgotten the one who taught him the difference between regret and repentance. Um, the one who equipped him, he's forgotten the one who reassured him, and he has most importantly forgotten the one who won the battle for him, the one who gave him the victory. And sometimes we do the same things. I mean, let's not put ourselves above Gideon and go, okay, I, I would never ever do that. Sometimes we do. We forget everything about our salvation. You know, we forget that all of our good works, everything that we do are all gifts of grace. Amen. They're not from our success. One of my favorite verses is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, For you are saved by faith. You are saved by grace through faith. And this, and the this that he's talking about, the faith, is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It's God's gift. Not from works. Why? So that no man could boast. And Paul goes on to tell us that we are all worksmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. You know, we would do well to remember that, uh, that we are saved by grace through faith when we fail, right? That helps us. But I'm going to tell you, I think we'd do better to remember that we are saved by grace through faith during times of success, that we would turn around and attribute all that success and, and push it back on God and praise Him. Because if we succeed on too big of a stage... And we do not immediately turn around and give it back to God. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, people will ask you to do some of the strangest things and accept some of the craziest positions in life. Listen to Judges 8.22 as we continue. Gideon's won this battle. Uh, Judges 8.22, Then the Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you as well as your sons and your grandsons. Why do they want him to rule over them? The last part of the verse says, For you delivered us from the power of Midian. <laughs> I can hear it. Gideon, you valiant warrior. He is a valiant warrior. He's won the battle. He is what God said he was going to be. Rule over us. Why don't you be our king? You know, forgetfulness is contagious for us. You know, just as Gideon has begun to forget who provided the victory, who was the, the reason that they had the victory, so has the nation of Israel. And now the nation of Israel has wrongly attributed the victory to Gideon and these 300 men that they somehow miraculously were able to win without God interceding. And, and Gideon, you be our king because you beat Midian. That's the cry of verse 22 for us as we get into the book. And the call comes for one, for one reason, because Israel doesn't want God to be its king. You know, the process was supposed to be that the, the judge would be anointed, the judge would rise up, the judge would point the people back to God, and in pointing people back to God um, after dealing with the current issues, and, and then people would go back to living under God's rule, right? So if Gideon says yes to this, if Gideon says, yes, okay, I'll be your king, then Israel is going to have a king that is appointed by humans. Now, let's be honest, that's, that's been Israel's desire all along. It just increases in fever and, and desire as we go forward. I think it happens in 1 Samuel, um, I think 8 is the call for it, and 1 Samuel 9 is when Saul actually gets appointed king and takes takes over as king for the nation of Israel. And then the reason behind the entire request is because Israel wants to be ruled by a man. They don't want to be ruled by their creator. But listen to this. Listen to Gideon's response. Verse 23, But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. Wait for it. The Lord will rule over you. 
See, if Israel has a human king, um, they're going to cease to look to God for salvation. And they're going to look to a human king. They will cease to wait for the Messiah, for the Savior that God is sending. So this human king that Israel wants is just another mm, strong stab at self-salvation. They want another way that they can attain salvation on your own. So Gideon turns down the request, and not just from him, but he turns it down from his sons as well. And save her that verse, brothers and sisters, verse 23. That last part is Gideon says, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Because I believe it is the last time in our, in our study of Gideon that Gideon truly understands who the Lord is. And then in the very next verse, very next verse, we don't have to go that far. He he almost he kind of goes back on it. He says in verse 23, you know, I don't want to be your king. I don't want the honor. I don't want the glory. I don't want the praise. You need to have God. He needs to get the honor. He needs to get the glory. He needs to get the praise. But in the very next verse, in verse 24, he says, Hey, let me ask you a question. Can you just give me some honor? And everybody bring me a gold earring. And throw the gold earring down. And give me some gold. Why? For what I did. So honor me because of what I did out on the battlefield. So you see the contrast there? He turns it down. He says, no, the Lord's going to be your king. But wait a minute. Why don't you all give me some honor and some glory? And in doing so, when he asks for just that one gold earring, Gideon becomes filthy, filthy rich with all the gold that he collects. Um... And he, and he sets himself up, up above his peers. And, and as I was looking at it, it's even by today's standards. By today's standards, with the price of gold, he would have over $1.2 million just from the gold. We're not talking the other things that he got from. So he has placed himself head and shoulders above his peers. But it gets worse than that. Because right after that, we're told that he takes it and he fashions it into an ephod. And when you read that, that he fashions the gold into an ephod, you get those your mind just goes back to when that gold calf just pops out of the fire because Aaron gathered gold and threw it in the fire. And Moses said, where did it come from? He said, just popped out of the fire. I don't know what happened. But it goes back to the idolatry and the sin that is going on. In verse 27a, it says, Gideon made an ephod from all this and he put it in Ophrah, his hometown. So Gideon, who said, I didn't want to be king, actually just wanted the side effects from king. He wanted the honor. He wanted the praise. He wanted the glory. He collects the gold, and he makes an ephod. What's the significance? Why all the consternation? And why am I starting to have uh, just thinking that Gideon's going down the wrong path? To, get only, to really get a grip on it, we need to review a little bit. We need to understand the ephod was worn by the high priest, and it was worn in the tabernacle where the very presence of God was, which at this point was still in Shiloh, if I'm not mistaken. That's where the tabernacle was. But here we find that Gideon made an ephod, and he set it up in Ophrah in his hometown. And on the front of the ephod were the Urim and the Thummim. Say that five times fast. The Urim and the Thummim. And they were things that they would pull out to seek guidance from God. And they would take these two, and they would throw them, and they'd either get a yes if they were alike on one side. They'd get a no if they were alike. If they were different, it would be... No answer, no answer that would come out. And it was used to determine God's will in a critical time. That's what it was used for. So Gideon, understand the importance here in creating his own ephod and placing it in his hometown, set up his hometown as an alternate place of worship. So people didn't have to go to the tabernacle. Gideon set it up and said, no, you can come here into my hometown. As a matter of fact, there may even have been um, a desire in Gideon to come to him, to seek insight and wisdom from him. And it, it's set up now where people can think that in his hometown of Afra, that's the place where God can be found. You know, I mean, do you see the downward spiral? Gideon used to use his position in life to serve God and to glorify God. And now Gideon is using God to glorify his position as he's created this, this 
alternate ephod, this alternate place of worship that's there. And if you're wondering why I think this of Gideon and why um, he's being shown in this kind of disparaging light, just look at the last part of verse 27. It says, Then all Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his household. Can you see more clearly here the downward spiral of the book of Judges? You see more clearly the downward spiral of just the Judges as we're, we're only into the eighth chapter. You, judges were anointed to lead people away from their unfaithfulness. They were appointed to lead people back to God, but Gideon leads them into unfaithfulness. Gideon is still judge when this happens, and it's after the people prostituted themselves. It's only after that that the scripture tells us that the land had peace for 40 years. So we see that Gideon is alive and well, that he has the ephod in his hometown of Ophra, and the people prostitute themselves. And then after that, we get the information that the land had peace. But we have to ask ourselves, is it a true peace? You know, can there be peace with God without worship? I don't think there can be. Can there, can there be peace with God without obedience? You know, is delayed obedience obedience? No, I don't think it is. And you, and you have to see this too, brothers and sisters, as we get to the point where we're getting ready to close out. Even though Gideon denied and would not become king when they asked him to be king, it hasn't stopped him from acting like a king. You don't have to look any further than his family arrangements. Um, all his sons, his many wives, as even pointed out, his, his son by a concubine who lives in Shechem. Uh, and the entirety of his lifestyle that is painted for us here in the scriptures is one who wants to be king who thinks he's king. Listen to these verses, 29 through 31 again. It says, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, son of Joash, went back to live at his house. Now here's his life. Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, since he had many wives. His concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son and named him Abimelech. Okay, and listen to that. And if that doesn't convince you just his lifestyle, then I got a big one for you. We're big on names as we've walked through the book of Judges. We've looked at names and we've looked up their meaning. Pay attention to the son of the concubine. What was his name? Abimelech. When you look up Abimelech, it means son of king. So everything about Gideon's life here towards the end, his legacy that he is leaving is of one that, won't, that wants to be king. Yeah, he may have rejected the king uh, in name, but he is living the kingly life in actions. And we're not even 10 verses removed, brothers and sisters, from the point where Gideon said, the Lord will rule over you. And I know that has no, no, no bearing because we don't know the time that has elapsed in here, but 10 verses after Gideon said, the Lord will rule, rule over you, we find Gideon living a lavish lifestyle as though he wants to be king. And I'm going to ask the question that we all want to ask. Well, I'm going to ask a question that I wanted to ask as I walk through this. I can't read your mind, but this is a question that I wanted to ask. How could Gideon turn down the kingship with the understanding that God is king, right? But then go on to live a life as though he is king, right? And I mean, that's huge. How does Gideon say, no, I don't want to be king because the Lord's going to be the one to rule over you, but I'm going to go on and live a life and act like I'm a king, and I want the honor, the praise, and the glory. But it's there. And I'm going to tell you the reason why. Gideon had a head knowledge of who God was. You remember back when he fleeced out um, God and he laid the fleece out? And I told you that uh, Gideon was seeking more clarification of the true nature of God. He wanted to understand God more. He had a head knowledge that never truly became a heart knowledge. I'm going to tell you, Gideon had an intellectual grip on the doctrines of God's grace. And I, Gideon could even give you the right answer um, at time in some situations. 
but his heart shows us that he never truly understood how it was supposed to work out in all of life's different situations. The, how that head knowledge was supposed to be transformed into heart knowledge that would make action and would make fruit that would appear in someone's life. Gideon didn't live out in action. That's an easier way to say it. Gideon didn't live out in action what he believed to be true in his head. Um, where the rubber met the road, whatever euphemism or saying that you want to say that we use in America today, he had the knowledge here, but it didn't manifest it working out in his life. You know, I do missions. I've been blessed to do missions and lead missions here at Highland Park, and I have yet to come across someone that goes on missions um, that gets to share the gospel or, or is blessed to share the gospel with anybody in Brazil and Romania. Um, in Malawi, wherever they want to go, that goes on missions to get honor and praise and glory for themselves. They don't do it. And after they all go on mission, they come back broken, and they come back humble. And then when they tell you about what they did, and you go, oh, that's awesome, I can't believe you did that. They will all tell you, I didn't do that, God did that. I can't tell you what I did, but I do know that I was standing there, and it was such a privilege to be used by God. Um, during that mission time that we were there. But sometimes we do act um, with Gideon traits. You know, we, we, we shout, Oh, God is king! But we still want people to come to us for advice. We still want people to come to us and pat us on the back. And we want people to think, yeah, go to them for guidance. Go to them for salvation. They can point you on the right track. They can give you everything that you need. And we all need to be needed. And there's nothing wrong with someone coming to you for advice or, or getting counsel from you as long as that counsel is from God. And they know that the advice and the counsel that you're giving them comes directly from God. Uh, but if we don't do that, then we, in essence, make our own ephod, Right? Then we put it on and we wear it and we set up an alternate place for praise and for worship. And brothers and sisters, that is eternally damaging to us. That's something that will take us down the wrong path quick. Instead, we need to look at the one who all the judges were a shadow of, Jesus Christ, and how he used his position when he was here. You know, he had every right to demand service as the king. You know, he is the tabernacle. He is the very presence of God. He is, as Revelation tells us, the king of kings. Yet he never gave in to temptation to rule over the nations. When the devil took him out in the wilderness um, and told him that he could have all those nations bow down to him, um, he said no. In Mark 10, 45, he made the statement, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When Jesus died, he ransomed us from our self-honoring reactions to success. When he died and we accepted him as Lord and Savior, we can have success now. We can turn and point to Christ Jesus as the reason for our success. He used his position as the only begotten, as the Son of God, to free us from our need for respect or to free us from being de destroyed in life because of the lack of respect. So brothers and sisters, I'll leave you with this as you go through life and as we continue on, don't create an ephod and worship it. Worship Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. He's the only one who's truly worthy of all our worship and praise. Thanks for being here today. Um, probably went a little long, and I appreciate you being here. We all... See you this Sunday, and God willing, we'll see you next Wednesday night as we continue our study, and we'll look at Abimelech, who becomes king in the nation of Israel in chapter 9 of Judges. Y'all have a blessed evening. Talk to you later.